Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, we are now going to start uh, with a conference proper, that is, with the first panel, um, the panel on the use approach to Eurasian connectivity. And um, I am really very happy to be in a position to present you, pre presenters. Uh, that have been dealing with Asian and European affairs for quite a while. Uh, they do not only represent uh, experience and competence, but they also do come from different sects. And I think this is what uh, is also very much needed when we discuss the topics, and uh, especially the topic that this conference covers. Um, Rainer Bütikofer, um, uh, as a member of the European Parliament, Fuderin Struck uh, is uh, the managing director and coordinator of the Asia Pacific Committee of German uh, Business. And last but not least, uh, Francois Nicolas is uh, the senior research fellow and director at the Center for Asian Studies at IFRI Paris, which is uh, well, a major think tank uh, when it comes to foreign policy and uh, French uh, uh, foreign policy, uh, France, um, uh, you certainly is uh, the highest important part uh, when we deal with these issues. Um, uh, may I um, invite uh, Mr. Wittikofer to start? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, first of all, for the invitation. Um, it's, in a way, a great, great respite for me uh, to, to be here for this conference today it, uh, um, allows me uh, to uh, focus on something else than uh, my present task and fate of campaigning for the next European election. <laughs> so uh, this is a pleasure. Um, I would like to start by stating the obvious. Europe has been very late in picking up the agenda of connectivity. There have been at least three other players that tried to entice us to be, become part of that before China developed its, its Belt and Road. There has been um, the Russian Federation, uh, President Putin during his first term in office tried to push the uh, Eurasia agenda quite a lot. It's uh, remarkable that today Russia is um, not at, not very very much not very relevant at, uh, in the discussion uh, over connectivity. It's it's basically turned into a pass through country. And when I visited in Moscow in January. Uh, academics were still discussing what term they should use to translate the term connectivity. So that, that gave you an idea of where they stand. But they were trying to promote the agenda before we understood it. Then there have been Asian ASEAN uh, uh, initiatives um, that we have um, cynically or um, a, uh, well, in any way, we have basically ignored them, not taken them seriously. And there have been, even been uh, US invitations. Uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, after she had invented the pivot in 2010 at the 2012 Munich Security Conference, fed up with all the nagging Europeans, basically said, do your own pivot. And then I think it was also her who invented the idea that Europe should pursue a new Silk Road initiative, even before um, Xi Jinping came into office. So Europe came very late. But we, I think the, the major reason was that uh, most actors were just reluctant to take note of the fact that the world is changing, that, the, that there is a continental drift uh, 
in political and economic terms. But you can't avoid reality forever, so we've not caught up with it in a way. Uh, it took not just China's old war initiative, it, should, it took some experience with the OBOR um, initiative to um, make us understand that we had to, to um, conceptualize our own approach. Uh, OBOR was originally welcomed with what I would still call blue-eyed idealism in Brussels. Um, but the uh, perception has changed to a more realistic assessment. The first step in dealing with connectivity, with the need to develop connectivity, was, in my um, analysis, um, taken when Europe decided to come up with new regulation to oppose Chinese dumping exports. So, so in a way, it paid tribute to the fact that there was a changing economic environment. And uh, also the uh, screening mechanism that Europe put up for uh, sensitive uh, third country investment in the European market was part of that first step. That was still just doing a little pushback against the new forces. The uh, s uh, second step was the connectivity um, uh, strategy that was published, which, uh, as Professor Jill said, still um, keeps us um, hoping that it will be um, uh, supported by some funding also. Obviously, uh, within the MFF, uh, the multi-annual financial framework, there is a provision of putting some 60 billion uh, at this strategy's disposal, but uh, we'll see. And the third step was the recent communication, I would say, which has been dubbed a uh, Copernican <laughs> revolution. Well, uh, that's possibly a, a bit too romantic, uh, but I still think it's a fresh breath of air uh, and uh, a new wind is blowing, and, and uh, quoting Mao Zedong, uh, who said uh, the east wind winds over the west wind. Well, at least the west wind is blowing more strongly now. Um, and uh, the fourth step, I think, has been marked by the uh, appearance of the uh, strategy paper that uh, has already been uh, mentioned uh, that Mr. Strack was uh, helpful in developing by the BDI, the German Federation of Industry, which showed that the mood in Germany's business community and more largely, I would add, in the European business community has been changing uh, over what it had been a few years ago. And the fifth step would indeed be, as Professor Jill demanded, to underscore the promises with some practical action. And, and I would, I would uh, be willing to identify three possible actions that could convince other actors, uh, in particular in Asia, that we mean it. One is already underway, which is CATA, the Comprehensive Air Transport Agreement that we are conducting with uh, ASEAN countries. The second could be a regional FTA with ASEAN, which is a, a policy that was originally pursued in, by the EU in two, 2007, given up because ASEAN didn't like it at the time. Today, we could return to that, possibly. And the third is very, very specific, and it relates to uh, an, uh, a sequence of events in Malaysia, when Matir, Prime Minister Matir, came into office, very soon he traveled to Beijing telling the Chinese that he was not in need of neo-colonialism. And he canceled the uh, Kuala Lumpur-Singapore rail project. My proposal would be, and I know this is overly ambitious, 
uh, that European industry and European governments would get together and offer Malaysia a better deal than the Chinese proposed. That could convince people that we mean it. Um, is China a threat? Well, I don't think we are in a similar situation as the US are. The US have changed their policy towards China 180 degrees. Since uh, Nixon first went to China, it was basically a policy of cooperating wherever possible. Today, the US policy is we will cooperate only where it is absolutely necessary. And everywhere else, we will push back. That is not a policy I believe that Europe can pursue. Uh, so yes, we should continue cooperating with China, but with a, a, a more clear profile and, and more aware of, the, of our own interests. Um, are we alone? No, I don't think we are. Uh, there are uh, a, a lot of other countries that are in a similar position vis-a-vis -vis the uh, race of elephants between the US and China, the two superpowers of today's world, um, all of which are too small to really stand up to these superpowers on their own, but if they can defend uh, the multilateral order together, that could rein in some of the more destructive uh, effects of this competition, he hegemonic competition between the US and China. And I believe that Europe could work on this. And yes, I also agree that we could weather the onslaught of authoritarianism much better if it wasn't for the internal contradictions that our own societies are suffering from. Um, I believe that it is not enough for Europe to say, yes, we advocate connectivity, whatever the specific definition of connectivity would be. We have to put ourselves in our partner's shoes. So for instance, I found that Secretary Carter, Secretary of Defense Carter, when he gave his farewell speech at Shangri-La, had a very good line saying, we're not opposed to China's rise. We just want to pursue a policy that allows all the Asian nations to rise at the same time. I think that could be uh, a good starting point for Europe's attitude, and we have to convince uh, our partners there that this is indeed our interest. And I believe that to some degree this is already resonating. So for instance, Singapore, has for a long time been very adversarial against any ambitions on the part of the EU to move beyond a role as a mercantilist power. But Singapore most recently has taken the attitude that, yes, we need the EU as a partner. And I think that shows some of the transformations that we have been not fast enough in adapting to. So for instance, when we uh, struck a so-called strategic partnership with ASEAN. Uh, unfortunately, the European Council insisted on um, creating a um, precondition, which was that we should be invited to the East Asia Summit first be before we would demonstrate that we met the strategic relationship. That was very foolish, I believe, and uh, now we're caught uh, in the consequences of that mistake. The role of the member states are, is certainly central, but I would warn against just identifying a few member states as the culprits, like say Italy um, signed this MOU. I think a couple of other member states have signed worse MOUs than this one, and when I look at the practice of my own country, I think it's also been extremely selfish in its economic and political relationship with China. And it's not been opening up to partnering with other European neighbors so that it basically exposes smaller European countries to the divide and conquer strategies that are pursued from China. So it's also on us. Uh, and uh, I believe that 
the question of whether this connectivity strategy will ever work rests very much not just on the willingness of Brussels to make it work, but in particular on the willingness of uh, Berlin to make it work. And my last point is um, we need to pursue this strategy, this connectivity strategy, for Europe to stay relevant and for Europe to stay united. If we don't become an actor, we will not um, be able to influence the course of events. It's uh, a basic either or. Either you're at the table or you're on the menu. And for Europe, um, it, I think the, the preferable option is quite obvious. Um, I don't think that we should pursue this under the guidance of the principle of strategic autonomy. I think that's about three bridges too far. We have much more immediate concerns uh, that we should pursue. And I believe that uh, the, the most immediate concern is, and that's my final argument, to make everybody understand that we are at a point in our history where the question arises whether we will return to the age-old game of big power politics, where according to the Million Dialogue, the strong act if, as they will and the weak act as they must. And I think it's the most important task for the EU to resist that tendency. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor, um, for your talk. And um, I suggest that we continue and uh, with the next presentation. And uh, afterwards, uh, after the three presentations, we'll then have every time for the Q&A. Mr. Schwab, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sebastian Berzik. Great pleasure to be here and great pleasure after a couple of years uh, working back, uh, working uh, together again. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy that. Um, and thanks for posing this topic here. Um, when I already told you in the, in the coffee break, um, when you applied for the pro program um, and uh, introduced the topic in 2015, it was quite far-sighted to set this topic uh, in 2015 uh, as, a, as a hot spot in the discussion. It was not self-speaking that it would be such a hot spot as it is today. Um, I will quickly run through seven points and thesis. Um, the first point um, leads me straight to the two introductions of this morning of you, Sebastian Berzik and uh, Reid Sitchell. Um, the global context has completely changed. Um, when we look at connectivity, um, EU, Central Asia, East Asia, um, and uh, I, I'm tempted to say we have a historic opportunity to play a new role um, as the EU in this global context. Um, why is that? First of all, um, we could lay back for the past 40 years in terms of security policy because there was always Washington to bail us out um, be it the East-West conflict or any other conflict um, and uh, uh, all of a sudden um, and my feeling was that um, the pulling out of TPP um, was a remarkable step where nobody really felt that the reliability of Washington is given forever. So this, this stepping out of TPP for me was a signal um, that to everybody in the world, not only to the TPP countries, um, that you cannot really count on historic um, commitments that you thought were given forever. But the second is why we Europeans um, could lean back in the past years was um, in all of the rest of the fields um, and mostly in economic, in economic cooperation we were strong proponents of the multilateralism. And again, if I look at the multilateralism, um, the WTO is in a very, very deep and fundamental crisis, and we are not convinced that 
the, the multilateral order as we have known it for the past 40 years um, will continue to exist and continue to, to be a solid basis as it was, for example, for German industry being globally so successful as we have been in the past years. So I fully agree with Reinhard Bütikofer's conclusion um, and put it in the words of Karl Billfeld, um, who spoke um, in our BDI International Committee um, 10 days ago at the opening of, uh, of Hannover Messe. He said, um, either the EU manages to become a global actor or we will be the playground in Europe of global actors, but not a global actor. Um, and it's only these two choices we have. Um, from, from the German perspective, we never felt it easy to say we want to take a more, a, 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 more uh, a stronger role in international politics, in international matters, whatever it is, politics, security, economics, um, uh, and it is easier for us to put this card um, on the Brussels table, um, but we never feel confident with make Europe and the EU great again, <laughs> but this is our way and this is the only way we see. The second point leads me more um, to connectivity. Um, clearly, I see uh, also, as Anna Bütikofer says, um, the connectivity strategy of the EU um, is a reaction to Belt and Road, even though um, I, when I prepared myself, I took a look in a couple of documents and one of the documents I found, I found quite interesting that the EU in 1993 um, issued the Transport Corridor Europe Caucasus Asia program, mm -hmm. um, which I never heard of before, um, but it has two remarkable things. Um, the, the program offered technical assistance for infrastructure development in Central Asia, and the program opened the Erasmus program for Central Asia, which is a remarkable step because people-to-people um, -people connectivity, I think, is really core to connectivity. Um, and we should not forget that we have a foundation um, and that we build on something, even though it is not seen. And we Europeans, we are extremely poor in, in marketing our initiatives. So um, our connectivity strategy from October 2018 um, is clearly a reaction um, to Xi Jinping's um, Belt and Road Initiative and it took us five years where you might imagine that German business we were quite complaining vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis the European Union but also policy makers in our member states um, when everybody talked in the business community for example everybody talked about Belt and Road our prime message uh, to policymakers was, okay, let's talk about Belt and Road, um, but let's define a European answer. We have it now, um, it's, a, it's a very good first step. Um, it maybe took a little too long, but that leads me to my third point. Um, we are not the fastest in Europe, but we are good. Um, we are good in doing policy and we do successful policy um, and I'm happy to go for, um, uh, you are criticized for, um, in, for Brussels bureaucracy and you often hear um, the blame. Um, today I try to point out our extremely strong spots and we do have these strong spots. Um, if we look at decision making of the EU vis-a-vis -vis China, let me pick three issues where I think the EU has been extremely successful. First is the reform of our trade defense instruments two years ago um, in the necessity, in the necessity um, to redefine the market economy status of China. There was a clear need to address this because we had the WTO protocol um, and the way forward for the, work, for the Commission to work this out was extremely good um, it was highly conflictual between different sides of industries, between Italy on the one side, Germany and Nordic countries being more liberal and open on the, on the Benelux countries on the other side. Um, 
we had fractions within German industry battling for a good solution. And the solution the Commission came up with is extremely well. Um, it allows us to deal well with dumping in China um, in the Euro or dumping uh, of Chinese companies in the European market um, in a manner um, where I think this is um, a role model how to deal with China for other areas where we have problems with China. The second is, um, and again, Reinhard, congratulations for, uh, for the good work and the work beyond party uh, interest and party politics. Um, for, for three months now, we have a European investment screening process in place, which is extremely good. If you would have asked me two years ago um, on the possibility of having a European investment screening process, I would have said, the possibility to have that in the next 10 years um, is probably 5 to 7 percent. Um, and we have it now. Um, it's extremely good. It's not a policy instrument. It's a framework for the member states, but it's a really good framework and it's a really good step forward. The third, um, it has been mentioned a couple of times, the China communication of the Commission is one of the best papers I've ever read. Um, it's only 10 pages of text, um, so it's easy to read. Um, the page 11 um, is the summary of the recommendations and action points, which are in the 10 pages already. So um, it's extremely dense, um, and it, uh, it uh, hits to the spots where policy action is needed. Um, I have rarely seen uh, a better policy paper. Um, the fourth remark is on the connectivity strategy, um, while the EU has labeled it uh, sustainable comprehensive rule based, I would label it um, uh, positive in a sense. First, it, it's we work with high degree of transparency. In the rule making process, in the legal process, that is the strength of our liberal economies, of our liberal market orders. We work in transparent orders um, and we do so also in connectivity. Um, we have transparent bidding processes, transparent guidelines. Um, we orient ourselves in international bidding processes when we issue projects. Um, so that's really a, a fundamental point for us. Um, second, um, in terms of sustainability, um, we are really good um, and we have something to offer. And if I look at German industry, um, it's an asset for the Chinese to get German and other European companies on board um, with BRI. Um, it's as well or even more an asset if we talk about our own connectivity strategy. Um, we try to be environmental sound um, in what we do abroad, our companies. Um, we try to be socially more inclusive. Um, uh, we, our companies are used to have a really high degree of local content um, in their local projects completely different compared to Chinese companies. They have very low local content. Um, and um, when we do projects, be it in Pakistan or wherever, our companies for decades are used to, to train and educate the local people to get involved in the projects we do abro abroad. Also, we have experience in the sustainability of debt structuring, structuring, but the Chinese have an extremely weak spot that we should make use of. Um, the third, we are rule-based. Um, we, as I mentioned in the transparency, we follow internationally accepted, accepted procurement roles, uh, rules. Um, we follow the OECD guidelines in developing assistance, um, and uh, we follow internationally accepted dispute settlement schemes, which also is uh, something that differs us from China. So all in all, the connectivity strategy, um, it came late, but if I would have to say from the business perspective, it's a very good move. Um, and uh, um, that brings me to my fifth point. Um, what do we address? 
the infrastructure need, especially in Central Asia, but in also in the rest of Asia, um, it's huge. Um, we in BDI and Asia Pacific Committee, we are convinced that infrastructure development is core to economic development. And I remember a couple of years, um, 15 years ago, you couldn't go to the German Development and Cooperation Ministry and teach them about uh, the importance of infrastructure because they had, sorry to say that so bluntly, gender promotion and stuff like that where, it, where they felt it's much more important. I'm not against gender promotion, contrary, um, but the, the, the basic need for infrastructure as the foundation for economic development, it had been underestimated and the Chinese said, well, it had been underestimated by the West for some good reasons um, and this is where we dive into and our answer now is uh, we are back in infrastructure financing. Um, the Asian Development Bank has always been, that's also part of why we are not so active because we are in the Asian Development Bank. Um, if we take together the European capital we have from the Asian Development Bank, I estimate we are around one quarter or even more, uh, one third of the capital of the Asian Investment Bank, but we are split up. Um, the Germans have 5%, five, five per percent, the French have 5%. Um, we have different executive directors, one for Germany, uh, Great Britain and Austria, one for France and Turkey and I don't know what, so it's really a very diverse pattern. We need to be better in that. Um, the ADB <coughs> estimates um, the, the need for infrastructure development um, in the next 10 to 15 years um, with 1,700 1, billion US dollars annually in the Asian developing countries um, with a strong need um, in Southeast Asia, the three, especially the three poorer countries in Southeast Asia, um, but especially in Central Asia. Um, and uh, that clearly leads us um, to, um, to the conclusion that Reinhard Bütikofer mentioned. Um, we definitely need to increase our capability to be an alternative for these countries. Um, the 60 billion you mentioned, um, I think it's, it's good. They, need to, they are not approved yet or not in the budget yet, but it's the planning. We definitely need that um, because, as you mentioned, um, it doesn't help us talking nicely about connectivity. Um, we need cash on the table and uh, that's all that helps in the end. Point six um, on Belt and Road. Um, we always said, or I, I said, do we need three kinds of strategies. The first strategy, and that was always the important, we need a European answer. Um, we have it, it's a good one. The second, um, we need to influence China to make BRI part of an improvement. And it does not work if China brings in the money, sets the rule, and establishes its own order, including dispute settlement. Um, we need to push China harder um, to follow international rules why do they, they do this, in, this initiative. I know it's difficult, um, but we should, not, um, we should not leave the Chinese alone, uh, just alone with doing their stuff. Um, we are a lot of countries. Um, we, the US is pushing the Europeans. Japan is not part of BRI, um, but uh, they are cooperating in third country cooperation since the Abe visit in Beijing. Um, so there is a lot underway, and uh, Australia clearly is a good partner in that. Um, the third track, of course, we encourage our businesses to participate in the BRI projects um, because it's a lot of money on the uh, on the table from the Chinese side and we could not tell our Siemens and others um, to stay away from this sort of business. They take all business they can and there is in our normal business world there are little distinctions between 
the good business and the bad business. Usually our business is gray um, and uh, we do gray business. We don't do black business. Uh, black business is embargo stuff and all that, but the gray business is partners you might want better partners, but uh, you choose the one that are uh, the, the partners able to pay. Point seven um, brings me back to the BDI paper on China. Um, why did we have this shift in perception? Um, to be honest, um, we didn't have such a clear picture when we started working. Um, we clearly had an analysis on the table. The analysis was um, that the China we see today is a different China than we thought we see a couple of years before. I think this China is the same, but we five years ago, I thought I see a different China, and today my perception of how China really is has fundamentally changed, and so in many players in business. Why is that? Because very simple, Xi Jinping um, in his party speech in October 2017 openly stated we want to be the world leader, we have no intention to change our economic system, our hybrid system with a very strong state-driven influence on economic players um, and no doubt about the Communist Party of China, um, uh, whatever we do it must secure the power of the Communist Party of China. So with this change, we thought, okay, maybe our dream that the world market is the strongest force of convergence that is possible. Um, maybe this dream did not come true in the case of China. Um, and uh, we need some new analysis. So we did this analysis and the longer we worked on this paper and we started working on this paper um, in uh, early 2018. Um, we had the core set in summer. The rest from summer onwards was getting our constituency on board. Um, but the process from, from March to summer was a process where with each week working on the paper, um, the more from national answers, the more we came to European answers. And that is my baseline and where, where I finish. Um, we, the China challenge for us in BDI is a challenge for Europe. Um, we feel in, in Germany that um, we are good in formulating German interests, but in the world of tomorrow, nobody cares about German interests. And the strongest German interest we have today is that we have a strong Europe, because that's the only actor that is seen. Um, and I think we are on a good way. Um, when I look back um, in November 2016, we had the Asia Pacific Conference in Hong Kong, and Kevin Rudd told us um, in the security <coughs> policy panel, um, actually, Euro you Europeans, you are not present in Asia, but that's no problem. We don't need you here. Uh, we get along fine. Um, there are other players more important. Um, the Asia Pacific Conference in November 2018, um, we had the same panel on security policy um, with John Blacksland from the National University of Australia and John Garneau moderating it. John Garneau, one of the brains behind the China uh, uh, policy change in the Malcolm Turnbull cabinet. Um, and the message was completely different. Um, the world has turned. And what we need today is a strong Europe being an actor in Asia, and this is where we want to be seen in the next years. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Vivian uh, Schrock, for, uh, for your uh, analysis uh, and for your very clear uh, statements. Um, I, I think this uh, presents us with, with uh, important context indeed to better understand why um, a re-evaluation um, not only in factual but also in perceptual terms uh, is taking place, is underway and, and it also reminds us uh, that we are not dealing with events but with processes. Um, <coughs>
so uh, for us, uh, it, is, it is very, very important uh, not to wait uh, uh, until um, um, the Big Bang happens, uh, but to actually trace developments while, while they take place. And um, uh, China's rise uh, uh, has taken place uh, now for so long uh, that it actually uh, has arrived, I suppose. And uh, this is the world, uh, this is the fact uh, that, that the world is uh, uh, waking up to now. Um, and uh, Francoise Nicolas uh, has uh, witnessed this rise and observed it for a long time. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, Sebastian, for uh, having me here to uh, share my thoughts on uh, this very important topic. But I, I'll start with uh, so a small remark. I, I couldn't agree more with you that uh, changes in mindset do not happen overnight. They may take time. And I think we have to thank China for pushing us to wake up. Uh, you, know, you, you can look at that from a positive perspective. And I think it's a good thing. And uh, in particular, I think that uh, the, this pressure that China is exerting on the EU has pushed the EU to get its acts together. And I think that's it's very positive. But if we focus on the case of Germany, let me be a bit nasty with Germany. <laughs> <laughs> As a French person, that's standard. Uh, I think that uh, one of the reasons why there was a change of mindset in, in Germany regarding China has a lot to do with the Kuka case. Uh, you know, until recently, I guess that uh, the position in China, in uh, Germany, was much more benign towards China. I guess we had more concerns in France because we were, well, under, I guess, stronger pressure due to our lack of competitiveness, etc., etc. Germany was much more relaxed until there was this acquisition of this robotics. And that was a shock. And I think that, that really was a wake-up call. I may be exaggerating slightly, but I, I think that just that slightly. was that just slightly. That was a real shock, and the, and so it pushed Germany perhaps to rethink or to look at China in a different way. And I, at the end of the day, it is a very positive change because then it pushed Germany to team up with the others. And I guess I would argue that it is one of the reasons why we now have this screening mechanism this joint screening mechanism, investment uh, screening mechanism. Without the Kuka thing, I'm not too sure that we would have it. But that was my uh, you know, French attack on Germany. <laughs> I'm sure you can do better than that. Okay. to find out. <laughs> now then, let's turn to the, uh, to the topic, to the connectivity uh, thing. So I agree with the um, a number of things that have been said before, and that the change in the environment has led to this, uh, again, change in uh, the EU's approach to, to Asia. And we, what, what I would uh, point as uh, important changes is also the, ten the rising uh, tensions between China and, and the US. This has obviously a direct impact on the, uh, on the EU. We are not, we, well, we're not part of the, of the friction, but we are victims of this, of this friction. And so, and, and this uh, rivalry or this trade complication between the, these two big powers are uh, likely to become a never ending story. <laughs> we, uh, I guess we're stuck with this uh, with problem for, uh, for a long time. And so this is a major change in the landscape. Plus, we also have a change in uh, Asian geopolitics. So as a result of these various changes, the EU has again to rethink its position vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the approach vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Asia. And so this is why it is uh, trying to define a, an optimal approach to, Asian, uh, to its Asian economic partners. So, uh, and the connectivity strategy, I guess, is part of this uh, response. But before I, can, uh, I address this, let me perhaps start with a couple of definitions. I have huge difficulties with this connectivity strategy because I think that it's very unclear what connectivity means. 
So I guess that we, what we need to do right from the start is to try to define connectivity. And in what has been explained, what has been said in the previous presentations, it's quite clear that we have very different things in mind. We have a number of things in mind, but perhaps all of us do not have exactly the same things in mind. So connectivity is, first of all, physical connectivity, infrastructure. And this is usually what people have in mind first. And in, in, indeed, you know, connectivity enhancement is about reducing uh, infrastructure bottlenecks and, and barriers to cross-border uh, trade and investment flows. But these barriers may be in the form of physical constraints, but not only. There may be missing links, there may be low-quality infrastructure, okay, but there are also other forms of barriers. And these other forms of barriers are institutional barriers missing provisions, uh, non-tariff barriers, incompatible regulations, a number of things that can think of. Uh, and so the traditional way of thinking about connectivity has tended, it seems to me, to target almost exclusively physical infrastructure development. But uh, I think that a more comprehensive approach is really badly uh, needed, and in particular, because Absent the rest, physical infrastructure is totally useless. So you need the two things at the same time. So you need physical connectivity, yes, which is about building hard infrastructure, mainly transport infrastructure, but not only, energy as well. But what is also required next to that is institutional connectivity. And this is about streamlining regulatory processes, harmonizing procedures, uh, harmonizing requirements, standards, etc., so as to achieve seamless trade in goods and services, as well as well, any kind of place we can think of. So th these two dimensions of connectivity are absolutely key, and they go hand in hand. And absent one, the other is useless. Then you have a third dimension of connectivity, which was highlighted by, I don't remember who, uh, which is people-to-people -people connectivity, which is also extremely important. And the mention of the Erasmus program extended to uh, uh, Central Asia is a very good example. So people-to-people -people connectivity is the third dimension of connectivity, and it, it is also a very important dimension, and it should not be neglected. So the three uh, should be in mind at the, at the same, uh, same time. Uh, on the, on the, this very uh, last point, the people-to-people -people connectivity, again, there may be also slight differences in definition. And some people, when they talk about people-to-people -people connectivity, what they have in mind is exclusively labor, labor mobility. But this, there, there is more than that in the people-to-people -people connectivity. So the next point beyond, beyond this definition is why, why do we need to enhance, or why do we want to enhance connectivity? Uh, again, on this point, I think that it's, it's important to stress that connectivity should not be seen as just an end. It, is, it, sh it should be seen as a means to an end. And connectivity is really about enhancing economic development. That's really the point. Otherwise, it's not you know, just connectivity for the sake of connectivity. The, the point is to enhance economic development and at the end of the day, to reduce development gaps. Uh, so this is why, I guess, as far as the EU is concerned, but I'll get back to that later, uh, the connectivity strategy it could be seen also as one aspect of the uh, development assistance strategy. It could fall under this uh, uh, item. Uh, so anyway, uh, the, the point of enhancing connectivity is really about uh, unlocking uh, growth potential. That's really the, the point. And uh, if, we, if we look at the, the details of, of that, uh, if you reduce transportation costs, then you will allow firms to uh, better exploit cross-country differences. You will allow them to engage in vertical com or, or complex uh, foreign direct investment strategies. And uh, in this way, multinational corporations will be able to separate their production uh, stages across countries and connect all these countries to get together. Well, that's the whole, whole, whole point. 
And this is why, at the end of the day, you will be able to uh, help or assist economic uh, development. So uh, connectivity is really about helping to make the best of complementarities and then connecting countries with, which are different levels of development and pushing all of them uh, forward. Uh, okay, so now let's turn, turn to Asia and the EU. If we look at the, the economic relation between these two vast regions, what we see is that the ties between the two regions are already quite tight. And these ties have reached an unprecedented level. And interestingly, the EU-Asia economic relationship is the largest bilateral economic relationship ahead of the EU-US. We tend to think that the EU-US relationship is the largest one in the world. That's not true. EU-Asia is larger. Uh, Asian markets account for over one-third of exports from the uh, EU as, as a whole, and almost half of the goods and services imported by the EU come from Asian countries. So this is really the largest, if I had prepared a PowerPoint presentation, I could show the graph to you, but of course I didn't do that. And there was no electricity last night. <laughs> That's why I couldn't do it. <laughs> now you know. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the, the, the economic relationship is already quite quite tight, but I, I guess it, it, is, uh, it can be an objective to tighten it even fur further. And the reason to uh, why the EU may want to tighten the relation is, as I explained earlier, the tensions with the US. The problems with the US push us to pivot towards Asia. And... Uh, what we observe also is that Asia is still the fastest growing region in the world. So after all, it's good strategy to turn towards this part of the, of the world. So economic growth in uh, emerging and developing Asia is uh, well, certainly expected to dip slightly, but very slightly, and the region will still remain the most dynamic over the uh, coming years. So it makes, uh, makes sense to try to develop the uh, relation with this part of the world. Of course, another objective is to respond to the Belt and Road Initiative. That's also a hidden, perhaps, objective. It's not an explicitly expressed objective, but it's also an objective. And here, I have some doubts. So let me tell, now turn precisely to the EU Asia Connectivity Platform uh, and provide some kind of a assessment. So the communication that, that has been described by the previous presenters is, uh, it's, well, the joint communication that was published is a nice document, because uh, it's not too long a document either. It's like uh, 12 pages or, or so, or 13. That's uh, pretty clear, with key actions for various sections. So that's a good strategy document from this perspective. The problem, I, I see a number of problems with this uh, <laughs> document. Though. One first thing is that, again, the uh, well, connectivity is not defined very precisely in the document. So we don't know exactly what, what the point is. What we see is that there is the willingness to expand or extend what is already in existence. And in particular, there is the, the uh, officially <coughs> Uh, what is being uh, targeted is the expansion of the transport network, the trans-European network. It's, that's one uh, aspect of it. So behind this, we, we see immediately that uh, hard infrastructure is very much at the center of the connectivity stra strategy. But what is not very precise is where do this various <laughs> transportation uh, network go? Nobody knows. Asia is not very clearly defined either. So connectivity is not very precisely defined, and Asia is not precisely defined. And Asia is a very vast region. So what are we talking about? Are we talking about ASEAN? Are we talking about China? Are we talking about Japan? Are we talking about Korea? All of them together, Central Asia as, as well. But we cannot have exactly the same approach to these various parts of, the, of, of Asia. Well, in the document it is explicitly said that there will be different approaches, but then there are no details about these various di well, these different approaches. So, um, to my taste, the whole thing is a bit fuzzy, both from the connectivity perspective as well as from the regional perspective. 
so that's one first big block of uh, issues that I have. Of course, another uh, issue also has to do with the means, the funds. And this is a very uh, often heard uh, comment about the EU uh, platform, which is about the means. And the means are ridiculous compared to the Chinese means. Uh, the means are, and it's been mentioned uh, b before, the EU uh, has promised to put aside some 60 billion euros in the 2021-2027 multi-annual financial framework. And these uh, this 60 billions will support the implementation of the connectivity strategy. But if you compare that to what Beijing is willing to put on the table, it, this is ridiculous. I mean, Beijing is talking trillion of dollars. So, you know, we cannot compete. Well, one f there are many things that, uh, that come with this, uh, this big money. One first point is that perhaps we should not emphasize this aspect too much. One first thing is that, well, of course funds are that badly needed, yes. But there, is all, there may also be problems if there are too, too much funding. Too much funding may be a problem for the recipient country. The country may not be able to actually absorb all these funds. So there is uh, a problem with if there is a too modest capacity to absorb funds disbursement. And this may be the case in a number of countries. So there is a, a risk of bottlenecks resulting from insufficient absorption capacity. So uh, em emphasizing the, the fund aspect may be uh, pro a problem. More, moreover, I think that uh, th this funding issue is not necessarily a, a problem. Or we should not see the fact that the EU doesn't have as much financial capacity as China as a problem. And this is in particular true if we do not exclusively have in mind the physical infrastructure dimension. If we also think of the institutional connectivity dimension, so in this case, this requires far less funding, far fewer means. And if we want to push for regulations or procedures, uh, rules-based, wh whatever, which is always pushed by the EU, in this case, you do not re require as many funds. So, you know, the, this issue with the funding may not be that much of a problem at the, at the end of the day for these two uh, reasons. The uh, next point is uh, the connectivity uh, strategy on the part of the EU is supposed to be a response to the Belt and Road. Well, I have some doubts about that. If you look at the Belt and Road, the objectives of the Belt and Road are extremely clear, even though they are not official. But they are extremely clear, and it is really pushing China's national interests. It is pushing China's development. It is pushing chi uh, China companies' internationalization. It is uh, pushing uh, chi uh, Chinese uh, Western regions' development. It is, uh, to a large extent, part and parcel of the restructuring strategy in China. So the objectives of the Belt and Road are extremely clear. The objectives of the uh, <laughs> EU uh, connectivity strategy are not as clear. So as a, as a result, you cannot really see that as a clear response to the Belt and Road. So I have a little bit of a problem with this uh, again. So what are the real objectives? If my two uh, co-speakers can explain that to, to me in a very clear way, I'd be, uh, I, I'd be happy. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, <laughs> two more points uh, which I see as slightly problematic in the, in the strategy is uh, the at least insufficiently uh, clearly expressed connection with the business sector. <coughs> so if, if you look at the way the connectivity strategy will be put in place, at the end of the day, it should be done through the business sector, through business involvement. And I don't see much uh, mention of the business sector in the, in the strategy. I understand that the business sector is very much willing to contribute and to participate. But in the strategy, it's not all that clear how it can be uh, associated. And a last uh, a pr problem also I have, which has, I guess, a lot to do with the definition issue that I um, highlighted earlier, are priorities. There is no priority list associated with the, the strategy. And I guess we would need uh, to have very clear priorities set. 
in order to uh, know exactly how the strategy will be uh, rolled out. Uh, okay, and now for perhaps a final point. I think, again, in the document, there are existing things. There are a number of uh, connectivity related initiatives that are already in place between the EU and Asia. And these initiatives are in particular the existing FTAs. We have a very good, deep, strong, serious FTA with Korea. We have another very deep, strong, serious FTA with Japan. We have an FTA with Singapore. We are, we are uh, negotiating a couple of FTAs with other ASEAN countries. So there are things already in place. And these are also about connectivity. And these are precisely uh, tightly connected to the institutional connectivity that I was uh, uh, stressing earlier. Uh, and so I guess we can also uh, start from this basis to try to uh, develop further uh, the uh, connectivity with, uh, with Asia. Uh, okay, well I see that uh, Sebastian is getting impatient, so I guess I'll, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 I'll leave it here. But I, I just try to be a little bit uh, provocative and uh, critical so that there could be uh, discussion. Good. Thank you. Um, so there are different um, ways of uh, looking at the strategy. Uh, what, what has been pointed out uh, by all uh, three speakers is that um, institutional relations do exist between the European Union and East Asia, uh, especially when it comes to, to free trade agreements that have been, uh, that have been signed and ratified. Uh, and here certainly Japan is an important uh, landmark event. Um, not so sure about uh, whether there or when we will see an EU ASEAN uh, 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 FTA that has been um, well talked about for a long time. Uh, we will do discuss uh, uh, Southeast Asia uh, today as well, so we can come back here. But uh, uh, for the time, for the time being. Um, this is when uh, the real discussion starts, and uh, Neil Collins, yeah, from yeah. what used to be Astana until very recently, mm -hmm. uh, last week, <laughs> has a question. Please, but it will be Astana for a lot longer, as far as I'm concerned. I'm interested in your uh, uh, point about the three types of connectivity, and some of it's people to people, and. Uh, and yeah, obviously not just about infrastructure roads and all that, people talk like that, but I uh, think Europe doesn't realise what advantage it has in the people-to-people -people part. I mean, the, the, I think that we don't take seriously enough the scientific and cultural diplomacy that we have in uh, with other countries, and particularly in Central, in Central Asia. Because if you've got two great big neighbours like, I was going to call it the Soviet Union, Russia and, uh, uh, and China, Actually, Europe is very important to you because it's an important third uh, party. And in the previous session we had about liberalism, etc. Actually, aspiring to be like Europe is quite common in uh, Central Asia. And I think if the EU got its act together and didn't let member states just uh, mess around <laughs> uh, on this cultural and scientific diplomacy area, uh, we could, there are lots of benefits we could have relatively cheaply without, as you say, we don't need spending the big money to get a lot of the benefits. would be my view. Yeah, yeah. Kazakh special please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, right, yeah. Um, yeah, there is a further uh, question. Yeah. Please, oh. please. Yeah. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you for um, your um, food for thought, and um, especially to you, Christoph, because it really reflected what, what, what was on my mind. Um, because um, I think that um, all of you mentioned China as one of the major challenges to um, the EU, but um, for me it's a bit like, um, well, we talk about uh, Eurasian connectivity, and there are other countries too that we actually not really talk about, and it's like you look at the fire that really burns high, and then you 
don't you know react or just don't see that the grass around is dry, so that's you know uh, facilitating the fire burning. And um, um, I think uh, it was you, um, uh, Fulmi Strack, that um, emphasizes on the um, regulation or law-based um, system that we are living in, in Europe. And um, if I take on a, maybe an, a more Asian perspective, I was wondering, well, how does regulation that actually is also um, to keep privileges that uh, European countries, for example, have, and also firms, companies, um, how does that actually help um, Asia? Because it's rather a burden. And also with the um, approaches that you mentioned that the EU is um, now taking on, it's really regulation-based. So, um, and um, what about the people-to-people -people dialogues or other aspects? So don't you maybe think that it's also just, um, we, Europe is just reacting to China and leaving out the rest of Asia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's collect uh, some questions and then uh, we'll have time to respond. Um, Suchampo? No. no? Okay, no, Marco no, Tengia. No. And um, then will be André. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, you first. Um, thank you. On a similar note, uh, there's been also a lot of discussion, not only in terms of Europe, China, but also Europe, Asia, about the role of sub regional diplomacy in Europe. Uh, in some cases, it's become very manifest, such as the 16 plus 1, possibly 17 plus 1 talks that China is having with Central and Eastern Europe. But we're seeing it in another direction. Like, for example, the Nordic region has been discussing at length the potential value of a Nordic approach to Asian diplomacy and Asian connectivity. So I was wondering if you could comment about whether you see this kind of new layer that's starting to appear, sub-regional diplomacy as a problem, an opportunity, or some combination thereof. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Andrei Kuborotov. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, all together, for the presentations. And I would just kind of to uh, maybe add on uh, the comment of my Chinese colleague about, oh, sorry, are, are you Chinese? No. So, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, so, sorry, about, about uh, other countries in Asia. Uh, as a Russian, uh, really, I do wonder. Uh, I, I mean, it's no wonder for me that Russia is mentioned only once in the EU connectivity pro uh, platform and never in these presentations. But nevertheless, I can maybe provoke you to express some of your opinions uh, about uh, how, how Russia is viewed in all that, because that's actually the only country which borders both upon West uh, European Union countries and, upon, and, and China. Thank you. I'll be, I was talking about the Russian perspective tomorrow, but I will be Absolutely. grateful for your view. Yes. Good. So, um, well, let's start uh, in reverse order. Uh, what's yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, on the, per, perhaps on the Russian point, per, personal view. Well, first thing my uh, co-speaker here mentioned Russia. <laughs> 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 Sorry about that. Yeah. Well, I, I, I noticed that. But I, I think that one, one issue is uh, and perhaps the fact that um, <laughs> Russia was not mentioned too often uh, precisely reflects the problem of the transit country. Uh, Russia is indeed between the EU and Asia. It's on the way. So what do you do with the on the way country? So is the on the way country part of the pro program, part of the strategy, or is it just the connecting link, so, so to speak. And w in which case, what do you do with the, the link in the middle? Is it part of the strategy? She, is it supposed to also benefit? Or is it just you know, connecting and that, that's it? So I don't, I don't know, and I don't want to, uh, <laughs> to, pre well, to make any comments about that, so I don't know exactly what the, the EU had in mind. Or whatever. But that, that's, uh, that's really a, a, a problem. Uh, on the, uh, on the point of, is the EU just reacting to China? I hope not. Uh, I guess that uh, China and China's pressure was the trigger for this uh, strategy to be developed. But I guess, well, I guess I'm, not, I'm sure, that the, the objective is much broader than that. So I see China as, and, and it's a little bit the same thing as for the investment uh, screening mechanism I was alluding to before. China is really the, the trigger. 
that it, it, it acts as a wake-up call. But, but then the, the EU, well, has a broader approach. So it's not, it's not just trying to respond to, to, to China. But I think it, it is you know, a realization that something should be done, but not exclusively or not only about China. But something should be done vis-a-vis -vis Asia. And that's why I, I, I said in the very beginning of my presentation, I think that another factor that also pushed the EU to develop a strategy is also the tension between China and the US. So the US is also part of the story. So it's not, it's not only about reacting to China. No. That's not the way I see it. And on sub-regional diplomacy, uh, well, I don't want to make any comment on that, but I would like to add another layer, perhaps, that is even more problematic. And this is the sub-sub-regional <laughs> diplomacy. <laughs> what I have in mind here are cities, for instance. And in the case of France, we have, we, what we observed was that one city was targeted by the Belt and Road Initiative, that is Lyon. And uh, what you see is sometimes a huge gap between the central government's position and the local government's stance. And in the, in the case of Belgium, that was pretty clear. Even though we should perhaps not make too much out of it, because in, in the case of Lyon, the train coming from Wuhan, you know, reached Lyon without people in Lyon even knowing it two days before. And all of a sudden, you know, they were informed that there was this train, and so all of a sudden, this was turned into a Belt and Road event. Mm -hmm. But that was really organized at the very last minute. Mm -hmm. But uh, of course, I mean, in Lyon, they were more than happy to have that. And they, and they are now connecting uh, much more tightly with, uh, with China. And same thing is true for, the, uh, for Marseille, for instance. And this does not necessarily reflect exactly the same position as the central government's position. So that's another uh, layer mm -hmm. to be added. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something that can be addressed. The, uh uh, the World uh, Initiative panel uh, yeah. okay. next uh, yeah. today, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow. Uh, because uh, uh, one colleague from Duisburg uh, will oh. speak as well. And Duisburg oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. is also it's uh, on the way. Well, it depends on how you look at it. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, yes, uh, it's difficult uh, as, a, as a guy from the business sector to speak on the question, are we in the EU too much regulation based? Normally in the business sector, I would say, yes, we have too much regulation <laughs> in Europe and Germany. Um, but uh, in this context, I would state it differently um, because um, yes, we are regulation based, but if we look at certain types of regulation, um, they address specific objectives. Um, I give you one example. One example that I mentioned in the context of connectivity and in the context of international procurement is um, guidelines and rules that we have agreed among the industrialized countries um, in the context of the OECD to ensure fair competition between companies. And we think this is a good principle um, and uh, business sticks to it um, and it gives us the certainty that um, in fair, transparent, open bidding processes, there is an absence of corruption, um, you get the better projects, you get a more sustainable financing. Um, so we are convinced that in some areas um, where you have strong rec regulation and including a bu bureaucracy, um, applying for these projects for our companies is extremely difficult and they hate it, but it's part of the international agreement um, and everybody sees the necessity of it. So uh, in, the, in this sense, I would argue um, our strong regulation-based system, um, when it is connected to clear objectives, yes, tag it and <laughs> we take it as a necessity um, of, our, of organizing our world. Um, on sub-regional diplomacy, I would argue um, in the absence of strong and clear European positions on China, sub-regional diplomacy, such as 16 plus 1, endangers us. In the presence of a clear, strong EU policy vis-a-vis -vis China, we have a continuation of all member states cooperating with China, the EU dealing with core issues, 
um, with the acceptance of all member states. And in that context, I would say 16 plus 1 would not really harm us. But I must also say that I'm quite happy that especially Finland blocked the cooperation of China with the Nordic countries because it would have sent the wrong signal at the moment. And I'm quite happy um, that we have more cautiousness towards these sub-regional dialogues. Um, on Russia, um, yes, um, I must say um, uh, we have a, a dissymmetry. Um, we, from the business side, we live with an embargo vis-a-vis -vis Russia um, that is not part of the long-term world we would like to see. We would be happy if we could come back to a much better cooperation, um, if uh, business would work well. But to be honest, um, the embargo with Russia has hit our business, especially in Europe, German business, because we have been the strongest in Russia, and we still are. Um, but it's no comparison if we would have a situation that brought us into an embargo vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, we have invested much more in China. Our trade flows are much bigger. Um, China for Germany is the trading partner number one um, before United States and Netherlands. Um, so um, I wish I could say that um, the not being connected so deeply with Russia um, would affect us more. It does not affect us so much, and we should work um, towards a situation where the not being connected deeply affects us. Mm -hmm. I have a good point. Let me start with the Russian issue. I did mention Russia, but <laughs> what I um, would still say is that I believe <coughs> Russia has not made up its mind. Uh, I understand the OBOR initiative as an alternative to the trade multilateralism that has dominated our international trade relations for the last couple of decades. What the Chinese advocate through BRI, I would call a serial bilateralism, or maybe I should rather say a hub and spokes approach. And the hub is in Beijing. And Russia is just considered to be a spoke, just like any other country uh, in this initiative. And Russia has to make up its mind whether it wants to be a junior partner to Chinese hegemony, or whether it wants to side with us and others to defend multilateralism. Um, uh, in, the, in the Munich Security Conference, there was a nice quip where people said the Russian foreign minister advocated unilateralism, but in, real, in reality, he depends on multilateralism. And the Chinese representative advocated multilateralism, but in reality, he believes in unilateralism. And I think Russia m must make up its mind. And once it does, it might feel it has much more in common with us than uh, the Russian leaders are presently conceding. The second point, um, European, um, well, I, I did not talk um, in my presentation a lot about why this change happened. And suffice it to say that I think since Xi Jinping took over, we've seen what I believe amounts to regime change in China. A uh, kind of uh, um, aristocratic communist regime has turned into a party-led empire. And the emperor is uh, controlling everything and teaches everybody in his uh, country that the party rules east, west, south, north, and everything. And I think that has changed a lot. And it took a while for us to realize that there was this very fundamental change, even though the, the, it's still the Communist Party that is in control, but it's a different kind of uh, Communist Party than the one that uh, Deng Xiaoping advocated uh, during the time that he, uh, uh, where he was prevalent. Uh, regarding the um, European BRI initiative, uh, you have called it fuzzy, uh, and I'm sure you're right. 
but in politics sometimes that's the way to make progress. If you want to wait until you have clarity on every detail, you will never get started. So you have to be willing to be a bit fuzzy and then work on the details later. And um, I believe that we have been clear on the fact that this is not just about physical connectivity. That's why I mentioned kata. That's why I mentioned the trade dimension. And also with regard to people to people, there have been initiatives, certainly not enough. I would agree with that. But for instance, um, there have been efforts to strengthen the involvement of Asian countries in the Erasmus Mundus program. And there has been an initiative by the European Parliament to start a Young Leaders Conference between ASEAN and the EU. So there are such uh, initiatives. And certainly, they should be expanded to the city level or the municipal level, which you just alluded to. I uh, hear similar stories from Duisburg or from uh, other municipalities in Thuringia, where uh, there is a need to really include these um, actors from the municipal level uh, and also give them um, an opportunity to learn about what they're up against. Um, regarding the, the BRI and the, European, the relationship between the BRI and the European Connectivity Strategy, I would insist that our connectivity strategy is not just a reaction to BRI. Now, I would say there are two dimensions. One is indeed a pushback against the hegemonic impulse uh, that BRI carries. But the other is a positive effort to shape another uh, relationship. And um, Europe has been doing that in two ways. First, by trying to agree with China on certain criteria for um, acceptable connectivity. So for instance, if you look at the uh, conclusions, the summit conclusions from the 2018 EU-China summit on uh, BRI, there are very clear adjectives uh, that the European side um, achieved um, or succeeded in, in including, which says, according to international standards and transparency and, uh, and sustainability. A lot of things that BRI doesn't live up to, but at least Europe sort of tries to define standards. And uh, on the other side, by shaping our own connectivity policy, we try to show that, that you can do better uh, than, than China is doing. And I think uh, there are a couple of criteria that we should work on. For instance, um, uh, sustainability. Clearly, BRI is anything but sustainable. According to the Chinese plans, several hundred new coal-fired power plants should be built as part of BRI. If, the, if even half of them would be built, Paris would go out of the window. The, the Paris Climate Agreement would go out of the window. Uh, and uh, um, in order to prepare the second um, BRI summit, China mandated a study on the compatibility of BRI and sustainable development goals with the uh, European academics. And when the academics presented their first findings, they were kicked out of the contract because China didn't like the results but didn't want to give them any facts either. So they rather wouldn't have the study than face uh, reality. Uh, that's why we should insist also uh, China is putting up uh, BRI courts. I think th this is something that Europe should look into. China is trying to uh, insist on applying exclusively national industrial standards in the context of BRI um, uh, deals, not uh, multilateralizing through uh, uh, the uh, International Standardization Organization, but in parallel push pushing explicitly Chinese standards, which is a, a form of neo-colonialism, I, I think you could say. Uh, also, the uh, 
the issue of competitiveness. Uh, according to a study from CSIS in Washington, about 90% of all the contracts that have been agreed so far in tenders under BRI have gone to Chinese companies. So is there, there is not even a little local content. Um, and uh, um, Fridolin Strack uh, mentioned the um, Asia, Asia Pacific Conference in Jakarta in November. There was a poll being done by the, by the organizers among the participants, about a thousand uh, German entrepreneurs. And the one question was, how many of you are hoping that they will get uh, a contract or that they will do have some business under BRI? And the number was more than 50%. And the second question was, how many of you have been successful in landing a contract? And the number was below, below 10%. So that's also the, uh, the reality of that. And uh, um, I think we should also look at the financing institutions, the IFIs. Uh, because when you look at AIIB, for instance, slowly but with full clarity, the Chinese president of AIIB is transforming AIIB from an original multilateral financing institution into a tool of China's foreign policy. And uh, th there's been a study published just recently on how this is being transformed, and that is uh, quite... Uh, quite an interesting, quite an interesting story. Um, I believe that um, uh, the last question I think was on 16 plus one and the Nordic. My general bottom line is that all European institutions and all European countries should insist vis-a-vis -vis China on them pursuing a one Europe policy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, they, they don't like the term, but I think that proves the point that it is relevant. Um, I believe that, on the other hand, it's, it's not very helpful if we just blame China for taking advantage of our own internal divisions. I did mention the role of Germany. There is no country in the EU that has more intense relations to China, economic and political, than Germany. Uh, Germany is the only country with which the <coughs> Chinese leadership has annual government meet, governmental meetings, <coughs> cabinet meetings. Um, the German government has agreed with China on a uh, innovation partnership that runs across 110 chapters we could do a better job of allowing some of our smaller neighbors to piggyback or to be part of that um, undertaking. But if we let them wait until a few crumbles fall from the Lord's table, well, maybe that's expecting too much patience from them. And if China waits with 10 billion investment, which small country can really resist that temptation? Now, China is not delivering. And the Polish, who were originally the ones who pushed uh, the 16 plus 1 the most, have already grown very dissatisfied. And the Polish prime minister didn't attend the last 16 plus 1 meeting, which was a clear signal of dissatisfaction. And now China is trying to push the 16 plus 1 into a more contentious territory by trying to force them to do deals that run counter to EU-only regulatory matters, which is not what the, the countries like very much. So I think there is a chance of reintegrating the, the European cooperation, strengthening European cooperation, and not just blaming China for some of the internal divisions that we have left festering. Oh, sorry, one, one thing I forgot about um, our connectivity and uh, Asia in, in general. There has been an ASEAN connectivity strategy before China invented the BRI. 
there have been initiatives in Georgia and the neighboring countries. So there are different connectivity approaches between East Asia and Europe. And I think it should be our goal not just to look at China, but also to look at these partners and find ways of teaming up with them. And I think that is what the connectivity strategy is very much about. Yes, and this is what this conference is going to be about, <laughs> I have to say. This week, not only the, the next 16 plus 1 uh, summit or meeting will take place in Croatia, and maybe Greece will join the clubs, uh, but also by the end, in two weeks' time, the second Belt and Road Initiative Summit will take place in Beijing. And uh, the question is indeed, who will participate from uh, the European side, which governments uh, will participate, uh, and also from the EU uh, institutions side. Um, one thing has become quite clear here. Uh, there is a need for regional, inter-regional, trans-regional governance in Eurasia. And uh, the question, though, is because there are many, this is about problem solving, right? There are many issues. But the question is whether the Belt and Road Initiative, which is in the process of institutionalization, whether this is the forum that can function, that can perform these functions. So far, there are doubts. And what is needed from a European perspective is something that I like to call BRIM, Belt and Road Initiative Multilateralization. Yeah. Uh, however, so far, if that should take place, then Europeans need to be present when those issues are discussed. Right. If they don't go, if they don't participate, uh, then they can hardly complain afterwards. But they need to be informed. And for that, there, is, there are other institutions, like for instance the Asia Europe Meeting, which have been there since 1996, to which more or less all of the actors in Eurasia, right, including Australia, uh, are participants. Russia is a participant as well. And uh, maybe it's time to rethink whether uh, more institutionalization is needed when it comes to uh, dealing with issues that can be broadly discussed under this uh, buzzword of connectivity. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good. I beg your forgiveness, but I forgot one, one yeah. argument that I think needs to be added. And that's about the ridiculous amount of 60 billion from the next MFF. It's not quite as ridiculous as, as it looks because this is meant to be a bag of money that facilitates a leverage 15 times, just like the Juncker fund has been leveraged 15 times. So, so if you look at that number, you get close to 800, 900 billion uh, that could be uh, could be um, initiated through that fund. So, so I'm not saying it's enough. I'm just saying it's not as uh, we're, we're not quite as stupid as we look. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you.